Joining me now to break down all of these stories of calamity on the global scale is our foreign correspondent and writer, Paul Joseph Watson. Paul, thank you for joining us today. So we'll just get right into it. You've got a bunch of articles up on Infowars.com. We'll start with this one. Top Lib, I'd lay money on Rand Paul being the next president. What about you? Any bets? Well, I mean, the, the point that Cenk Uger is making of the Young Turks, and that's that's a pretty big show, you know, over 2 billion views on YouTube. So that represents a large slice of the progressive liberal audience. And he's saying that the 2016 presidential election will come down to a face-off on foreign policy because this tactic of the Obama administration of airstrikes against ISIS and arming so-called moderate Syrian rebels to fight ISIS will be, as it has been in the past, a complete disaster. Because you're going to have Rand Paul, who has steadfastly said, and he recently said it again on CBS yesterday, that arming these extremist rebels, and as Tony Schaefer said, 80% of them are radical jihadists, is going to backfire. Because we know that people like Hillary Clinton, people like John McCain, supported this exact same policy in Libya arming radical jihadists aligned with airstrikes. And of course, in the case of Libya, it was a complete and utter disaster. The country is now a failed state. It's been overrun by radical Islamists. You've got black people being put in concentration camps. Any enemies of the warlords of the terrorist gangs that are running Libya now are incarcerated, tortured or killed. And that's exactly what's going to happen in Syria. In fact, if we had armed, if the U.S. government had armed the rebels back two years ago, ISIS would now be in control of Damascus. And people like Hillary Clinton and John McCain are pushing for this yet again, even though we know, for example, just a couple of days ago, FSA, so-called moderate Syrian rebels, signed a ceasefire, a non-aggression pact with ISIS. There are also numerous examples of them not only defecting to ISIS and fighting alongside I ISIS, but actually giving weapons to ISIS. And in fact, I put together quite a lengthy article on this last week. I think it was called Obama Plans to Fight ISIS by Arming ISIS. And in that article, I point out, for example, this quote from an ISIS fighter called Abu Atiyah, who told Al Jazeera, quote, we are buying weapons from the FSA. This is the FSA that Obama now wants to rearm in order to fight ISIS. This is an ISIS fighter saying they buy weapons from the FSA. We bought 200 anti-aircraft missiles and concourse anti-tank weapons. We have good relations with our brothers in the FSA. So ISIS and the FSA and the numerous other examples of this are fighting alongside each other, are exchanging weapons, and yet Obama has now announced that he will give more weapons to these radical jihadists, again, 80% of them in Syria at least, are radical jihadists aligned with ISIS in some cases, fighting alongside them. Rand Paul comes out on CBS and basically says it, it's a disastrous scenario. The same thing that happened in Libya is going to happen again. Hillary Clinton, who of course vehemently supported the attack on Libya, laughed when Gaddafi was killed, and John McCain and other rhino establishment Republicans are standing on the opposite side of the debate. When it comes to 2016, Rand Paul is going to be on the right side of history, which is why the Young Turks host said he would lay money on Rand winning against Hillary Clinton in a runoff, in a potential runoff in 2016. Right. Well, it's going to be very interesting to see when they go head to head and how they're able to spin these erroneous talking points when people can actually see with their own eyes the failed policies and Clinton saying repeatedly, well, we should have armed them in the first place and now we've got to arm them now when Rand Paul has consistently said that the issue is that they're receiving these weapons anyway. They're being handed over to ISIS. It's also going to be interesting to see how, you know, that they're going to spin what McCain has just recently come out to say. Um, we saw those pictures floating around with him meeting with ISIS, and now he's basically using that as, a, uh, as an attempt to scold Rand Paul. Let's take a look at what he said. Has Rand Paul ever been to Syria? Has he ever met with I, ISIS? Has I, he ever met with, with fight, any of these sir. people? No, no, no. I, we're going to have a fight because it's patently false. 
This is the same Rand Paul that said we didn't want to have anything to do with, with anything to do in the Middle East, by the way. I don't want to get in a fight with him at all. Yeah. But it's not true. I know these people. I'm in contact with them all the time. All right, then let me and ask he you is this. Not. And he is not. Uh, Senator, and he is not. I, I, so McCain basically goes on Fox News and makes a gaffe, says that Rand Paul isn't qualified to speak about ISIS in Syria because he didn't meet with ISIS. Of course, McCain meant to say FSA rebels, but get, then again, as I just discussed at length, many of these ISIS or these FSA fighters are aligned with ISIS and have given weapons to them. McCain met actually with FSA rebels who had kidnapped Lebanese pilgrims. And according to some sources, McCain encouraged those rebels to keep those Lebanese pilgrims hostage in order to further the U.S.'s geopolitical agenda at the time. So he was, he was basically meeting with terrorists, and now he's chiding Rand Paul for not meeting with terrorists. I mean, not a lot of what comes out of John McCain's mouth makes sense, and this is another flagrant example of that. Right, and we've got all of these situations going on now in the Middle East, also now in Africa, and you've got an article out about a Chinese PLA professor basically saying we, sh we could be looking at a third world war, and he's there warning, um, warning about this situation over Ukraine and Russia. Yeah, I mean, extremely concerning. Again, this is, this is out of the People's Daily, which is basically the organ of the Chinese Communist Party, the ruling regime in China, and he's a, uh, he's a PLA professor at a university, and he put out an editorial today which basically says, China needs to be prepared for a third world war which could break out as a result of the crisis in Ukraine and the tensions between the United States and Russia. Um, he basically goes on to say that the next world war will be about sea power. Obviously, we've seen Obama announce the U.S.'s pivot to Asia. And it will also be fought on the front lines of the internet, cyber warfare and things like that. So again, you know, we've seen Russia and China moving increasingly closer in recent months. They recently started work on a $400 billion gas deal from a pipeline from Russia to China. We've got the BRICS countries announcing their own anti-IMF money system. We've got them building their own internet outside of the spying purview of the NSA. So the, NS, the uh, BRICS countries are building a multipolar world, which stands in stark opposition to the unipolar system being advocated by NATO, the US, and the European Union. And of course, Ukraine, whose government was installed via a, a coup instigated by the US and the EU, is a central flashpoint in this tug of war between the BRICS countries and the NATO countries and the United States. So extremely concerning that a, a top PLA university professor would come out and say the threat is there for a third global conflict if NATO, if the US and the EU continue to escalate this situation with Russia and Ukraine. Right. I mean, it just seems so strange that they continue to poke the bear that just so happens to have nukes. I don't understand. It seems well, like that's I mean, what you'd not want to do. It's amazing. And you know, the, the senior Russian defense ministry official came out last last week and said that Russia is now going to change its military doctrine to treat NATO as an enemy and that preemptive nuclear strikes would be justified against NATO. Because, I mean, they see them, themselves being encircled by NATO, by these missile defense systems that, that are being readied for countries like Romania. And all you've got to do is look at a map and see that that's exactly what's taking place. You know, the agreement at the end of the Cold War was explicitly for that not to happen. Now NATO is going back on its word, encircling Russia, um, increasing hostility against Russia, despite the recent ceasefire with Ukraine. They actually intensified the sanctions against Russia. So rather than walking it back and trying to let cooler heads prevail, the EU and NATO countries intensified those sanctions to prod the bear even more. So they're really acting like little infantile children right now. Uh, again, karma heads need to prevail because it, it's a genuine threat, as you said, with Russia being nuclear armed. Right. And basically this warning that the conflicts in Asia are going to rise, uh, it seems like chaos is just descending over the entire planet. Now, earlier this year, of course, we reported on Bilderberg and their agenda. And obviously, the Asia pivot is one of those things. But also on the topic was uh, Africa's challenges. Now, 
at the time, I was thinking, no one ever talks about Africa. The U.S. is never concerned with all the genocide that has gone on there. Now, all of a sudden, this is at the top of their Bilderberg agenda. And we see that Obama has now said he does want troops on the ground there in Africa. So what's going on here? Are we seeing sort of a slow creep into that country? Um, obviously, humanitarian crisis is an excellent way to, to get boots on the ground there. Well, the situation with Africa is, of course, again, it goes back to the BRICS countries. It's a tug of war between China and the United States. China is invested to the point where uh, their investments total more than double the United States in Africa. So they've got most of the infrastructure, the resource contracts for what is obviously a very poor country and represents a huge lucrative op opportunity for whoever is allowed to develop it. But the United States has the far larger troop presence there. In fact, I don't think China has any troops there apart from UN peacekeepers. So I think the United States is attempting to accomplish what it couldn't via economic deals, which, again, Obama attempted to push last month at, at this Africa summit, by using occupying troops, which, of course, they have a lot in the region under AFRICOM. And now, as you said, similar to the Coney 2012 scam, which was kind of a failed attempt to justify U.S. military uh, intervention in Africa. We might be seeing it with this Ebola thing. The other point about it, of course, is the sanity of sending 3,000 U.S. troops into a, an area ravaged by this virus, which now top experts are saying could kill 5 million people amidst speculation that it may have gone airborne. We know that it's mutated. So the, the logic of sending 3,000 U.S. troops there, obviously, you could understand sending, you know, CDC workers and uh, first responder emergency health personnel. But the logic of sending U.S. troops there has been questioned by many. And as you said, it could well tie into the, the U.S., the Obama administration's economic and military designs on Africa's resources. Well, exactly, because sending that many troops, it's obviously pointing to the potentiality for a huge crisis this has. But we also have the issue that Obama just recently changed uh, the, his authority to now be able to detain any Americans. So here you're sending in 3,000 troops. Now, if any of them do come in contact with this disease, they can be detained. Are they going to be able to come back into the country? It just doesn't make any sense if you're looking at it from a purely... Uh, disease control type scenario. Well, exactly. I mean, similar criticisms were heard when they brought the um, American doctors back to Atlanta who were infected with Ebola when the same treatment was available in Africa. There was no real reason to bring them into the country. Then, of course, you've got a story we covered yesterday, which is the fact that the State Department has ordered 160,000 hazmat suits specifically for the purposes of uh, dealing with Ebola. Um, a, an, an extremely high number, given that the amount of CDC and American health workers in Africa at the moment is basically, I think, in the hundreds. So to have them order 160,000 hazmat suits seems like they're getting very prepared for something, whether the American people will uh, receive the same level of information about the preparations they need to do remains to be seen. The CDC has been very coy about Ebola sufferers in the United States which is partly understandable to prevent hysteria. But again, it's interesting that they've ordered such a large amount of hazmat suits. So again, top experts, you know, saying that the, the cause for Ebola in Liberia and Sierra Leone is lost, that it's just going to infect the entire population and millions will die. Hopefully that doesn't happen. But the fact that top virologists in Germany are saying that is an extreme concern. Right. Well, and also no one is talking about the fact that they are working on Ebola as a bioweapon um, there, right there where the outbreak occurred. Uh, we reported before how they issued a report saying they may have been responsible for this particular outbreak. Uh, the U.S. holds a patent on a particular strain of Ebola. So it's all sort of curious timing. It's curious, yeah, but you don't see the rush to you know, vaccinate everybody in the United States and Europe like you did with swine flu, which mm -hmm. is something I've pointed out before, because the difference is they already had the vaccine lined up and they sold it on the hysteria when, in fact, swine flu wasn't really a danger to healthy people. So we didn't see that in the case of Ebola because there was no lucrative profit motive behind it. It seems to a certain extent, as long as it's just 
black people in Africa being killed by this, there's no real urgency to solve the problem, which is what other experts have said as well. Absolutely. Well, Paul, thank you so much for joining us today. It's always great to get your point of view. Uh, we'll be seeing you soon. Thanks, Liam. And you can find many more reports and articles by Paul Joseph Watson by becoming a member of Prison Planet TV. You can find all of our reports there, as well as instant access to The Alex Jones Show and The Nightly News, as well as movies. And your username and password can be shared with up to 11 people at the same time. And of course, it is your contribution, your support that allows us to bring you all of the news that you crave. Thanks for tuning in tonight. We'll see you here tomorrow at 7 p.m. Central. You are watching the InfoWars Nightly News, which airs 7 p.m. Central at InfoWarsNews.com. Members can share their passcodes with up to 11 other people, and your support is helping us defend liberty worldwide. You've experienced and heard about the benefits of super male vitality. Now, the new formula has arrived. Introducing the new super female vitality. I have specifically designed this formula to help the body naturally regulate itself without the use of artificial hormones. Key ingredients chosen from the highest quality sources. Secure your super female vitality today from our limited stock at InfoWarsLife.com.